you're a scientist, you trained as an astrophysicist, and then you decided to leave all that and become an astronaut. What ever possessed you to do that? Why did you want to leave your scientific career and become an astronaut? Well, I'm not really sure why. Uh, when I came to NASA, I didn't think of it as leaving my scientific career. NASA was, was very good about uh, extending us the opportunity to continue our research and encouraged us to do that. And I, I did that for a couple years after I, after I came to NASA. Um, as I was here, I got more and more involved in the space shuttle and less and less involved in my research. So right now, I'm, I'm really not doing any scientific research. But I, I didn't intend to leave research when I came to NASA. So what is so compelling about going into outer space? Why did you want to go into outer space? I really don't know. And uh, I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I don't know what the reason is. But I think that some of the people in the world understand immediately and would love to take my place and would love to go up themselves. And other people really don't understand the reason for it. And I think that it's, it's just something that's inside people that they can't, uh, can't explain. Tell me about the highlights of basic training. What was it like? OK, the first year of our basic training was a lot different than most people imagine. Um, the press only filmed the aspects of the training that looked exciting when we were during, doing water survival or parachute training, that kind of thing. But really, that only took up maybe four or five days of that year. Most of the year was spent in the classroom learning about the space shuttle systems, the space shuttle experiments, a little bit of background on the shuttle. And um, it was just like going back to school. So there, there really weren't any, any highlights or any, any horrible moments. It was all very much like, uh, like being back in the classroom. I know you've had a lot of questions about being the first woman and a lot of dumb questions and press conferences. I've heard them all. I can't imagine how you survive them. But is there any way that being a woman and an astronaut has made any difference, either positively or negatively or in any kind of funny ways, uh, that you're willing to talk about? <laughs> I really don't think that there, there is um, any aspect of the training or of the flight where it's made any difference that there have been women astronauts on the crew or not. Our training is uh, really asexual. You know, the, the women and the men go through exactly the same training. The women and the men do exactly the same jobs on orbit. And weightlessness is a great equalizer. You don't need to be strong to do things up there. And it's, uh, there is really no difference. What does the Earth look like from outer space? How can you describe it for people who never will never have a chance to see it? I mean, what is that like? You can't describe what the Earth looks like. And it's, you know, I've been trying. And I, I found that I just can't do it. And a lot of the pictures that we took, although they're spectacular, we look at them and, and we're always disappointed because it just doesn't capture what the Earth really looks like. And, there, you know, it's, it's spectacular to fly over the Himalayas in the moonlight and have them look like they're just reaching up to touch you. And you can see rivers in the moonlight. You can see uh, fires all along the coast of Africa. You know, it's just a beautiful sight that it's too bad everybody doesn't get a chance to experience it. When you come back to Earth after having that experience, do you see Earth any differently? Do you see your surroundings or your life on Earth differently? I don't think that, uh, that space flight had that effect on me. I, didn't, uh, I don't think that I viewed really anything in, in my world differently after the flight uh, than I did before the flight. Um, what is weightlessness like? How can you describe being in zero G? Weightlessness, weightlessness is fun. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's a completely different experience. You can't simulate it on the ground. None of our trainers even attempt to, to simulate that. We have an airplane that, that flies like this, and when you go up over the top, you get about 30 seconds of weightlessness. But it doesn't come anywhere near preparing you for the feeling in orbit. It's very benign environment. It's very easy to move around. And I know that uh, personally, while I was up there, I, I felt like that's where I belonged. You know, that it was much, much easier for the human body to, uh, to function in weightlessness than it is with, uh, with gravity. You know, if you want to get from one side of the room to the other, you just push off from one wall and, and you're on the other side. Can you imagine living in space for extended periods of time? Have you thought about, would you live in a space station? Would you participate in that? I don't think there'd be any problem with living in space for extended periods of time. And the Soviets are proving that. They've had people in space for well over 200 days with apparently no, uh, no ill effects. And I would certainly volunteer for something like the space station or a long duration mission. It's, your body adapts very quickly and very easy to weightlessness. Okay, great. Um, okay, George Abbey said that he knew you'd be under a lot of pressure when they picked you to be the first woman. Was that true? What kind of pressure? Was it only from the press? I mean, what, 
in retrospect now, what was that about? For you? I was obviously under a lot of pressure after I was picked. I think uh, most of the pressure was... Wait a second. Okay, go for it. <laughs> well, there was obviously a lot of pressure um, on me when I was selected to be the first woman. I think that, that most of it was generated by the press. Uh, there were a lot of requests for interviews. Everyone wanted to talk to me, and basically I was trying to train and NASA was trying to get me trained. And I think that NASA did a very good job, especially before the flight, of shielding me from the press and allowing me to train for the, the job that, uh, that I was supposed to do. Um, right after the flight, of course, NASA wasn't there to shield me anymore, and uh, I, I just had a lot of attention focused on me. I knew during the flight that after the flight I was going to get a lot of attention, so I think that there was quite a bit of extra pressure on me just to avoid mistakes. Uh huh. Did that make you feel angry or disgusted or proud or, I mean? I don't think I felt angry or disgusted. Uh, I certainly felt proud. I think that anyone would have under those circumstances. It made me um, all the more determined to do things right and to, and to look professional while I was up there. That's great. Um, Okay, we have these great shots of you right before you go into the orbiter and you're putting on your helmet, you know, that NASA took and you're waving and what was going through your mind? I mean, there you're about to step into this incredible machine. Well, we, as we were about to step into the orbiter just before the launch, I think that we were all a little bit apprehensive about what was about to happen, but more than apprehension, I think we all felt excitement. Very, it's a very exciting situation. You're the only ones on the launch pad. You've just gone all the way up this elevator to the top, nearly, and there are just three or four people up there, and they're the ones that are, they're only there because they're gonna strap you into the orbiter and then they're gonna leave. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. You've got a, a very strong feeling of, uh, of teamwork. You know, you feel like you're part of a team, and it's a very lonely feeling as soon as the, as soon as the people close the hatch and kind of wave goodbye to you and, and head down the, leave the launch pad. Um, can you describe what re-entry is like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? I read there's sonic booms. I mean, what, you're done and you're coming back. What is that experience? Well, re-entry, uh, re-entry is, is one of the more interesting parts of the flight. When you first re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, for example, uh, the orbiter comes in and ionizes the atmosphere as it comes in contact with it. That's what causes the communications blackout, but it also causes uh, just a brilliant orange glow that surrounds the orbiter. You look out the windows and all you see is bright orange that kind of fades into pinks and reds and it's, it's spectacular and I was glad somebody told me about it before I saw it for the first time. Once you, once you get down a little bit lower and you start feeling the effects of gravity, uh, even though you're not feeling very much, you're maybe feeling half a G or half what we are feeling right now, uh, it feels like an awful lot because you're not used to it anymore and checklists get heavy and cameras you feel like you're carrying 200 pound cameras or 300 pound books. Um, my job during during re-entry was to hold the checklist, read the checklist and follow the procedures along with the commander and the pilot and help them monitor the systems. So I really wasn't looking out the window and didn't have much of a view anyway so I'm, I'm not too sure what it what it looked like it feels very, very smooth. There are a couple, couple spaces, especially right around Mach 1, just as you're going subsonic, where you get kind of a, a burbling. You get a, a lot, of, lot of shaking, but not very much more than that. And we don't hear the sonic booms, oh. of course. So, you know, the, Otherwise, the landing uh, feels surprisingly like, a, like an airplane landing towards the very end. Were you disappointed coming back after seven days, or were you ready to come back? What was that feeling like? I think when it, when it came time to to deorbit and come back. Um, we were ready to come back. We didn't necessarily want to come back, but you psychologically prepare yourself to be up there for seven or eight days, and when seven or eight days are up, you know, you start looking forward to re-entry because that's, a, that's another new experience that's, a, that's, that's an exciting, exciting event. So we were, we were ready to come back. On 41G, when Sullivan and Leitzman were preparing to do EVA, did you have some role, and were you assisting them in getting dressed, or what was your participation in that? When uh, Dave and Kathy were getting ready to, to do their EVA, basically uh, I was was helping I was helping Crip and working with Crip up on the, the flight deck. 
John McBride was helping them uh, put their suits on and preparing them, getting the airlock ready and helping them with their EVA. And I was doing things like uh, changing tapes in our, our video recorders and positioning the arm for helping them during the EVA and uh, operating a couple of the experiments. Um, there's this great footage of the, all of you guys at the end of 41G doing this little round robin and going around and around. What was going on? What were you thinking about? Well, we had seven people on the flight. We staged that, obviously. And we had seven people on the flight, which was the largest crew that's ever flown. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of talk beforehand that that might be too many people, and we had a lot of questions about the habitability in the shuttle with seven people. So we just decided to stage one, one camera shot where we all flew by the camera twice. <laughs> So it looked like there were 14 people. looked like there were at least 14 people in there. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, you've been at NASA for six years, and it took you about six years, not took you, but it took NASA six years to get you up into your first flight. And where do you think you'll be in five years? Where do you want to be in five years? Five years from now, I have no idea where I'll be or what I'll be doing. I have, uh, I have no goals right now. I'm not really a goal-oriented person. I don't have anything that I'm looking forward to in five years or ten years or twenty years. And there's uh, nothing that I'd rather be doing right now. I'd, I'm intending to stay with NASA as long as, uh, as, the, as long as they'll let me stay. Okay. Um, oh, tell me what is T-38 flying and why is that part of your training? And it looks like a lot of fun, but is there something more about it related to going up in the shuttle? The T-38 flying is a very important part of our training, and I didn't, didn't appreciate how important it would be until I, until I came to NASA. One of the first things that we, that we learn is uh, how to coordinate as a flight crew, and you learn that in the T-38. You learn to appreciate what the pilot's doing. The pilot learns to trust you in uh, navigation and communication. You learn how to use the radios, you learn how to use all of the, uh, the navigational equipment, some of which is similar to what we use in the, in the space mm. shuttle. And I think that it really provides an environment that uh, is closer to a space shuttle type environment, that is a flight crew environment um, that nothing else around here provides. Okay, tell me about the kind of training that you had to endure to be able to be so proficient at the arm and what you did in this space. There's a lot involved in the training to operate the arm. I started, uh, started working with it right after I came to NASA, the first year that I was here, and worked a lot with the, the engineers up in Toronto where the arm is made in the, the engineering development. Spent a lot of time in their simulators. Once I uh, got assigned to a flight, that's when I really started spending the time at, at mock-ups like this, where we've got a, a real live arm. You know, it's a piece of machinery that you can move around and, and fly around and you know, you can bump it into things, you can break things with it, and this is the only simulator that you can do that. The arm itself is not strong enough to support itself under gravity, so you can't use the real arm on the ground. You can only use it in orbit. All the other simulators that we've got are computer-generated simulations, so you're looking at a computer drawing, and it's almost like a video game. You're, you're playing a video game, and although you're doing all the things that you would do, what you're seeing is a computer scene. And this, this right here, um, is really our, our only opportunity to move real equipment around. And we spend, seems like forever, <laughs> in this building, hours and hours and hours, and it's a very important part of our training. Okay, good. Um, being an astronaut is more than a 40-hour-a-week job. How do you, how, how, do you have enough? How does that fit into your life, or is being an astronaut your life? I mean, just kind of a typical week, a typical day, is mostly devoted to your job. Just a little description about Well, being about an astronaut is not a 40-hour work week. Um, every day is different, especially when you're training for a crew. You're apt to spend 12 to 16 hours in the simulator one day, spend the next day flying to, might be Florida for a, for a test, it might be Colorado to visit a, an experimenter and see the the experiment that you're actually going to be flying. You might spend uh, the next day over here operating operating the arm. Every day is different and every day is long, especially the two or three months before flight. Uh, you probably put in, you certainly put in at least 10 hours a day and work at least one day on the weekend. So uh, really the training for the flight becomes your life. <laughs> that, that is your life for the two or three months before flight.
we have this great shot of you on the treadmill eating cashews. I mean, it looks like you guys play a lot, play around. I mean, not that you don't work, but there's, a, there's an element of fun. And, that's true. And, uh, that's true. Is that because it's weightlessness? Is it because you're so close together? Is it, I mean? Well, I think uh, uh, there's really a sense of camaraderie while you're up there. You're part of a team. You're great friends with the people that you're, you're flying with. You've been training with them for a year. It's just like a family in a new experience. And people ask if there are funny things that happen, and there are hysterically funny things that happen. But it's almost, it's like slapstick comedy. It's, you can't describe it. There's no, there aren't one-liners that come out. It's just uh, the whole effect of being weightless and bumping into people and spinning around and spilling your food that is just kind of keeps you laughing for, for quite a bit of the time.